Okay. Hi, I'm Julia Bowman. I'm one half of the Birth to Three team at Illinois School for the Visually Impaired. I've been with ISVI for about 11 years. Prior to that, I was a chemist. Um, but when my daughter was born, she was diagnosed with severe visual impairment, and eventually she was diagnosed with multiple disabilities. And our experience in the infant toddler program at Perkins School for the Blind is really what inspired me to go ahead and change careers and become a teacher of students with visual impairments. And then to really focus on EI, focus on birth to three, because I feel like that's where we can make the greatest difference. So with that, I'll turn it to Sarah. Hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the other half of the birth to three program at ISVI. My story is very similar to Julia's. Um, I did not start out as a teacher. I actually was an actuarial technician. Um, and then I had two children, um, now 18 and 16, and they have both been diagnosed with Lieber's congenital amaurosis. So they, when they were younger, they were obviously involved in their early intervention program. We worked with the DTV very closely and she always encouraged me to go back to school to become a teacher for the visually impaired. So once my daughter started um, her school program when she was three, I myself went back to school and became a TVI, knowing that like Julia, I wanted to focus in our early intervention program because I wanted, wanted to work very closely with the families when they learned of their children's diagnosis as well. So um, with that being said, I have been with ISBI's birth to, three, birth to Three program for about 11 years as well. So. Okay, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. So we can get started. Okay, so today we're going to talk about early literacy skills. This is a topic that all of our parents in birth to three ask us about. It's something we talk about often. Parents want to know how they are going to help prepare their young children to access books, to access literacy, to access print or braille information in the environment. So we're just going to have um, an overview. We're going to talk about the definition of early literacy. We're going to talk about the areas of development that are involved when we work on early literacy skills. And then we'll go into some strategies to promote early literacy skills in the homes in birth to three. So what is early literacy? How do we define that? Well, first of all, I just want to say that I use this term interchangeably with emergent literacy. So I see that everywhere. When I'm looking up early literacy strategies, I see emergent literacy and early literacy used kind of interchangeably. So um, that's my personal liberty I'm taking here. <laughs> early literacy is based on oral language and concept development. All of those conversations we have with our family members and with our babies beginning at birth, we start talking to our little ones, you know, right away. We're you know, just telling them how lovely they are and how much we love them and then telling them about everything that's going on around them. Early literacy has to be established before any formal instruction in printer braille can begin. So literacy and communication are really intertwined. You can see the graphic on the right shows us how, you know, listening and speaking, reading and writing, they're kind of a two-way street, but they also connect to the other components. So infants and toddlers are learning to listen, to speak or use AAC, read and write all at the same time, although not necessarily at the same rate, but it's all in an interconnected way. All of that language, communication and literacy, that's all connected. Literacy is also highly dependent on our understanding of symbols. So the two symbols in the left and center, you don't even need print or braille to interpret these, I'm sure. Like we know exactly that red octagon, it means stop. We know those golden arches, that means McDonald's, it's time for some French fries. So those symbols, that symbolic understanding, that's a key to be able to move into understanding the written word or braille. Uh, we use symbols like the ones that you see on the right to teach that symbolic understanding. We might start with 3D objects, moving to 2D tactile symbols like the ones in the picture, um, and then moving towards 2D or print or braille. 
So I found this great PowerPoint presentation that you can access at the link below. And hopefully Catherine will put that link in the chat as well. Um, it was on, it was within an article on the Paths to Literacy website about early literacy or emergent literacy skills. This presentation was given in 2005 by the Early Intervention Training Center for infants and toddlers with visual impairments at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And it's really a deep dive into the skills that children need to develop in order to be successful readers and writers. And they break it down and they have six components. I've kind of compressed it a little bit of early literacy that they describe. First, we start with auditory discrimination. So when we think of infants and toddlers, they're just trying to make sense of the sounds that they hear in their environment and then eventually discriminate them. So, you know, one sound is separate from another, try to identify the source, make meaning out of that sound. But what we're aiming for is to move on up the hierarchy to phonemic awareness, to try to understand and discriminate individual letter sounds. Another component is comprehension of language. As I said, we start talking to our babies right away and they hear us having conversations about our day, talking to you know, other family members, but what the babies will begin to comprehend earliest um, is the language that's based on their own experiences. So they'll learn to understand words that are related to their routines. They might understand blanket or bottle before they understand bicycle because they haven't had experience with a bicycle yet. Uh, another component is introduction to the alphabet. So understanding that we take these symbols, these letters to make sounds and build words. Pragmatics, these are the conventions of print or braille. We learn that books have a cover, they have pages, and that we read left to right. And finally, pre-writing opportunities. I'm sure all of the teachers on here today would agree with me that those writing opportunities are just as important as reading opportunities, especially when they're little. So when I start talking about literacy with the families I work with, I want to make sure that we, we have in their homes a language-rich environment. And for many of my students, from my little babies, this means getting Braille into their homes. So what Sarah and I will typically do is Braille labels for different objects that are in the home so that we can affix them. So we can have you know, a Braille label on the refrigerator or on the dresser or on the child's toys or just things with the child's name that belong to that child so that the child can see, see feel Braille everywhere in the environment and know that language is everywhere. We also want these little ones to have access to books and braille books aren't that easy to find. So we make sure to register them for programs such as APH Braille Tales or Speedlings or National Braille Press where families can access braille books for free. We, we also really emphasize those family conversations. So sometimes with our little ones, especially those who have additional support needs or additional medical needs, they don't always get included in these daily conversations. So just for example, I'm thinking of mealtime. And I just had a, a, a conversation with a family last week about having the baby at the table, even if he doesn't eat at the same time as the rest of the family. You know, Even if he has his G-tube feed, he should still be there with the family so that he can listen he can absorb, he can hear what these conversations are about. All right, I think this is where Sarah's going to take over for a little bit. Yes, thank you. Okay, so now we are going to look at each area of development and identify different strategies that we can implement that will promote growth in early literacy or emerging literacy skills. And you'll see that when we discuss early literacy, we really are referring to so much more than just books. We're not implying just putting a book in a little child's hand. There's really a variety, a huge variety of skills that we're working on. But, but, but before we move forward, sorry, and share specific strategies in each area, I just want to take a few moments and provide a brief overview of each domain and how it can relate to early literacy. So let's start with cognitive development. Early literacy activities enable us as parents, they enable us as teachers to introduce new concepts or, or ideas to our children and our students. And when we build an awareness or understanding of different or new concepts, then that correlates with an increase in cognitive development. 
you know, they're beginning to understand or have a better understanding of what's around them, their surroundings, you know, just the world in general. Also with early literacy activities, children become aware of print and text and the fact that it means something. So just as Julia mentioned the symbols, you know, they may not recognize or identify a print letter or a braille word, but if we expose them, they become aware of that print and that braille and they become aware that it means something, you know, it tells a story. Can we go back? Thank you. Uh, when we think of language and communication, both expressive and receptive, we often think of conversations. And as Julia mentioned, conversations, you know, they, they hear our conversations from day one, we're talking to them, you know, the minute they're born. And conversations are a natural experience for our children um, to expand their vocabulary. It helps them expand their vocabulary and the phonemic awareness. During the conversations, they hear they identify and they can manipulate the individual sounds of spoken words. So we are going to share some strategies today that encourage conversation with our children and our students. It will encourage our students to reflect on different experiences that are meaningful to them. And we're also going to share strategies that will help bring awareness to initial letter sounds. And all of these activities will also promote um, growth in cognitive development. When we look at motor development, you may not initially think of early literacy skills, but really there's many activities that we can implement that will promote growth in both motor and early literacy skills. So we are going to share strategies that incorporate both gross and fine motor development. We're going to talk about how we can help them improve their posture, how we can um, help them improve their strength, both the core and upper body, um, how we can encourage movement, you know, get them moving so they're building, um, you know, that gross motor. We're also going to look at the fine motor. What activities can we um, incorporate to help those fine motor skills so that they can manipulate a book, hold a book, turn, turn the pages, or engage in some writing activities and scribble. Moving on to self-help and social, obviously these are two separate areas of development, but today when we talk about different strategies, we're actually going to combine these areas. When we um, work with children um, and, and get them involved in activities, obviously um, we know that they love to make decisions, right? We, they love it when we follow their lead, let them make the choices and we validate their choices. They feel important and they are important and, and they should feel that way. So this helps with self-help skills when we're giving them opportunities to make those choices, pick what books they want, um, we, they want us to read to them, pick what activities they want to participate in, help find the materials to get involved in those different activities. Also, when we're involving, you know, when we're participating in those different activities with them and giving them opportunities to make those choices, that's helping with social development. You know, we're, we're right there, we're involved with them in communication, we're involved in play with them. So that's helping with that social development. And obviously it's a positive experience. So it also um, helps with some bonding at time as well. And finally, while engaging in book play and early literacy skills, we obviously want to encourage our children to use their vision and compensatory abilities as much as possible. We would like for them to view pictures, to view the print, and to actually explore any tactile images or braille materials. So starting with cognitive and language development, we want to start by encouraging our children's or our students' active engagement. If Julie and I have ever said anything, we always say we want our children to be active participants. We do not want them to be passive learners. So a couple strategies we can implement to encourage active participation is helping them turn to the next page, not always doing that for them, but prompting them to turn to the next page. And we can use that by, or do that by using, you know, the language and communicating turn the page. So they start understanding what that means. And so they become, you know, the little page turners and become active participants during story time. We can also pause and stop during the stories 
and start asking them questions um, to recall maybe some prior experiences. And this involves interactive language. So if I'm reading a story about a little boy who went to the zoo, I might stop and say, well, do you remember when we went to the zoo? Do you remember listening to the elephants or smelling the monkeys? Um, so that language, that communication um, helps them recall memories and engages them in some conversation. Also, if they're viewing the uh, illustrations or trying to find pictures, um, whether they're you know, actual pictures or whether we have tactile images, that can help or we can encourage them to find the top or the bottom of the page with some tactile markers indicating where something can be found on the page. So that helps with some concept development as we introduce those positional words. And then also just to, while they're exploring a book and they're actively, actively involved, we can start identifying the different um, parts of a book. You know, this is the cover of the book, the back of the book and the different pages. We all enjoy the use of predictable books. They provide rhyme, rhythm and repetition. Um, we can start off reading and then stop or pause and see if our child or our student will fill in the repeated or the rhyming words. So again, this really encourages them to be active participants, not just sitting back and listening. Um, and with these predictable books, you know, they're familiar. They can often sing and act out the different stories. And we um, will talk a little bit more about that in motor development as well. So Julia and I wanted to share some of our favorite predictable books, and these include Brown Bear, Brown Bear, Five Little Monkeys, Good Night Moon, and Pete the Cat, I Love My White Shoes. Another strategy for cognitive and language development is the use of story boxes or bags or even storyboards. If you're not familiar with this idea, this is just actually using the actual objects to illustrate the story. So particularly if the child is not um, or has low vision and maybe is not able to view the illustration in the books, then we bring the objects to them so that they can explore that object while the story is being read to them. So as you can see um, on the top image, it's a little bin with the book Clifford's Bedtime and we have a, bed or a bear included in the bin along with a pillow, a blanket and a little doll. So the, these objects are provided to the child as the story is being read to them so they can actually explore and have a better understanding of what's happening along the story. As the child starts being able to recognize and identify objects or tactually discriminate objects, then we no longer have to provide that object to them, but we can take it one step further and have them find the object in the bin that goes along with that particular um, point of time in the story. And then as we have pictured below, you can also make, it was a storyboard, sorry. Thank you. Yeah, so in the bottom there, we have My Very Hungry Caterpillar. And rather than a story box, it's a story board with all of the um, fruit and vegetable items up Velcro to the board. All right, we can also use story buckets. So this is a very, uh, it's basically the same idea as a story box or a story bag. It's just instead we're going to use a bucket and we are going to fill the bucket with items that illustrate the story. So just like I mentioned, you just want to put the objects that are associated with the story inside the bucket that gives the child easy access so that they can actually explore or search for the particular items. Along with story buckets, you can also make concept buckets. So this would help with some con um, cognitive development, um, some language development as well. So you can make different uh, buckets based on um, the concept. So I have some examples here, like a summer bucket. Maybe with a summer bucket, you would include a pair of flip flops, um, some sunglasses, um, some sunscreen lotion that they can smell. Um, whatever it is that's meaningful to the child that means summer to them, you would put those items in a bucket uh, to, to go along with the, you know, the theme summer. So what is it that they associate with summer. 
You could also make buckets based out of objects like a dinosaur bucket. Maybe you have a student that really likes dinosaurs. So you fill the bucket with different dinosaurs that they can actually discriminate and identify based um, on what they find. You can make a bucket based on a theme. I have a, um, a birthday party bucket. So maybe you put candles, birthday hats, um, bows, wrapping paper. Again, what is it that the child associates with the birthday party? And you can fill that with a bucket. You can also make a bucket based on an initial sound, a letter. So an example here is a letter B. So you would fill a bucket only with items that start with the letter B, like a bear, a ball, a block, a bus, that type of thing. And that would help them with learning um, their different letters and the, and the sounds. All right, moving on to story bars and concept bars. This is very similar to the story boxes or story buckets. As we have pictured here, um, Julie and I refer to the PVC pipe as actual dangle bar. Um, excuse me, we use dangle bars typically to just hang a variety of items to encourage the little ones we work with um, to interact with. You know, we, we want them to move their arms and their hands to interact and get some type of tactile and auditory feedback. That's typically how we use a dangle bar. However, we can adapt dangle bars and turn them into story bars or concept bars. So if we want to make a story bar similar to the bucket and the box idea, um, rather than put the items associated with the story inside a bucket or a box, we can actually hang those items from the bar. This may be extremely helpful for kiddos in different positioning or they have different equipment. Maybe reaching into a bucket or a box is a little more challenging for them. And maybe depending what they're seated in, pulling them or having them seated right up next to a dangle bar where they can reach out and to actually explore and interact with the objects hanging with the story would be more beneficial to them. So as we have pictured here, that's a story is where is baby's Valentine? And we have hung the objects that correlate with this particular story, like the flowers, a teddy bear and a heart. We can also adapt dangle bars into concept bars. So very similar to the concept buckets, you can hang pretty much whatever you want, whatever type of category um, you would like to work on. Some examples would be seasonal. Um, I provided an example of a summer bucket and maybe with the dangle bar you want to focus on winter. So where we live, our winter would include hats and scarves and boots and gloves, anything that keeps us warm. Um, again, you know, you can just teach different uh, seasons by what items correlate with that particular uh, concept. You can hang items based on color. So maybe you're working on color recognition or identification, and you would only hang items of that particular color that you're focusing on. So maybe all green items or all orange items. Similar fashion, you can focus on shapes and only hang items of one particular shape that you're working on identification and recognition. So maybe all triangles or all circles. You can hang different textured items if you're working on tactile exploration, and you can also um, adapt the dangle bar into uh, or only hang items based on different holidays and events. All right, the last strategy we're going to share in the cognitive or language development domains include alpha boxes. So alpha boxes provide exposure and promote exploration of different objects. So the idea here is that you only put objects that start with that, um, that letter. So going back to the bucket where we had a letter B bucket, you can make an alphabet, alpha box based on the letter B. So pictured here, we have a bear, a bird, a bus, we have some bells, we actually have a bumblebee, and we have some braille. So this just helps the child explore objects that start with all of the same letter um, and it helps with that pairing of the initial sounds. When I was a student teacher, one of my cooperating teachers, she had alpha bags and we had a bag for every letter and it was filled with different objects, um, what, with whatever letter that was. And so obviously some letters are easier to fill with objects than others. And the day we would work with the student, we gave the student a choice as to what letter she wanted to explore. 
And she went and got that bag and explored the different objects that correlated with the letter of um, the letter that she chose for that particular day. All right, moving on to strategies that promote motor development. Again, we want to incorporate those strategies that encourage active participation. So during story time, we want to provide opportunities for them to turn the pages as I um, mentioned earlier. So a few strategies that we can include to really help them is by using board books, particularly for our little children. It's really difficult for them to separate those paper pages. So we like those board books and we can adapt the pages so that they're easier to turn. Um, one way I like to do this is by staggering popsicle sticks. I have a small picture in the lower right hand corner where I glue popsicle sticks on one side of the page. I stagger those popsicle sticks down. So they're basically used as levers. So if they have some motor challenges or just a really difficult time getting their fingers you know, up underneath the, the pages so they're only turning one page at a time rather than basically opening and closing the entire book, they can grab those popsicle sticks and turn the page as they go. I've also used colorful round stickers. Like if you think of the garage sale stickers without the money imprinted, just the plain colored round stickers and sticking two opposite each other on each page, you can stagger those down too and those would create tabs. So the, um, the child can reach for those tabs to turn those pages. I also like to um, add raised textures to keep those pages separate. You know, we probably all have like kind of raised the page a little bit with our finger. So it gives um, them more success as they go to turn the page and just get one page at a time. But you, we can also add raised texture, textures in the lower corner, like just a raised glue dot. Um, will keep those pages separated or sometimes I use those really, really small like furniture sliders. Um, yeah, furniture felt. For, <laughs> exactly. Thank you. I use those as well. I stick those just one on each corner and that separates the pages too. Okay, some more strategies. Um, you know, just encouraging them to sit and hold the book, um, you know, sometimes we may think that there's not much more to that than just, you know, engaging in some book play. But actually, while they're sitting and holding a book, they're working on their core strength, they're working, they're working on their upper body strength and, and their posture. So just having them engage and looking at pictures or exploring a book while they're sitting um, actually promotes some motor skill, um, some growth in motor development. We can also set up an art table. We can include a variety of materials, whatever you know is of interest to our children or students or wherever their skills are, whatever their abilities are, we can include the materials so that they can be active participants while playing at the art table. You know, blank paper, markers, crayons, paint, glue sticks, scissors, if they're capable, envelopes, you know, old envelopes, stamps, Play-Doh, um, a brailler if you have access to one. Obviously, we want to include a braille writer. But while they're participating in play at the art table, we're really encouraging children to use their emergent writing skills. So whether they're drawing or scribbling, and again, scribbling on the braille writer works too, um, they're creating letters, they're creating stories, and they're creating notes. Now, it may not look like that to us, right? But if you engage in conversation with them and ask them what they're doing or what they're creating, they're creating something. They're writing a story, or maybe they're writing a letter to their mom. Um, so this is a great opportunity for them to work on those you know, emerging writing skills and gets them thinking. And oftentimes, if you think about it, they're standing while they're engaged at, a, at an art table. Um, or of course, if we have the appropriate size chairs can be sitting as well. So that's all helping with um, their gross motor. And if they're engaged in coloring, it's a great time just to sit down, take a minute, color with your child, color with your student because coloring is a perfect um, bonding opportunity. 
And we always want to encourage our children to be active. Again, we just do not like our children to be passive. We want to see them be active as much as possible. So both gross and fine motor development, they do aid children in becoming effective writers. So, you know, we want to encourage our children to be active, to climb, to run, to skip. Um, to build that gross motor strength. Um, we also want to include fine motor skill activities like lacing or stacking, you know, dressing, um, because that helps those smaller movements and those smaller movements, again, will help them with the, the writing later on. We can always implement scavenger hunts because of course scavenger hunts will encourage our children to move around um, and to find items that we have hidden somewhere you know, we can hide items that go along with the story. So maybe we aren't going to put all of the objects in a story box or a story bag for our children right there. Maybe we want to scatter those around the room and have our children move around and find the items associated with the story. Or maybe rather than an alpha box and have all of the letters or have all of the objects that start with a specific letter right there for them in a box, again, we can scatter those around and have them find all of the objects that start with the particular letter. Those scavenger hunts can be modified for our students or for our children that have motor limitations as well. So we can um, get everyone to be involved and active as much as, much as possible. And lastly, we wanted to share um, some of our favorite stories because we like it when we can um, get our, our children acting out actions in the storybooks, you know, kind of, as I mentioned earlier, singing along with different songs or, um, you know, going along with different stories and acting them out. So some of our favorite books are Llama Llama Hoppity Hop because they can imitate those movements, Going on a Bear Hunt and Tickle Time by Sandra Boynton. All right, moving on to some, some smaller um, fine motor activities um, are those that include, um, that, or those that promote strong hands and fingers. Um, this is so critical for early literacy. I'm sorry, I was reading. I'll have to think about that one, Julie. I'll have to think about that one. Um, so strengthening hands and fingers are so critical for early literacy because it prepares them to be braille readers and writers. So when I first started working with families, um, I tell this story quite frequently, but one of my students, um, she, you know, she was not a petite girl. She was a very strong girl. I mean, not unhealthy by any means. I mean, she's just a strong, strong girl. And they did not think that she was going to have any problems writing braille. So I took the braille writer in one day and let her scribble and she could barely press those keys down. So it really showed the family um, how strong their little hands and fingers have to be to, to push those keys down and actually make an indent on the paper. So we really want to include activities that promote bilateral hand use. That means we want them to use their hands at the same time because when they're reading and writing braille, we typically want them to use both hands simultaneously if possible. So any activities that encourages bilateral hand use is good. We also want to um, include activities that promote ice, them to isolate their fingers. They use these six fingers primarily to write braille and then these two fingers to read braille. But when they write, they are you know, pressing down each finger separately and some of those fingers are more difficult to isolate than others. So activities like pushing on Play-Doh or pushing things through an opening and having them isolate their fingers doing so is, is beneficial. Scribbling, as I mentioned, that's helping with some fine motor skill and strengthening those hands and fingers. Any toys or devices that require them to push buttons strengthens their fingers as well as promotes um, isolating their finger use. Ripping paper. I tell families all the time, like get the Sunday ads or old magazines and just let them sit and rip the paper. That's a great um, activity for them to strengthen their hands and fingers. Walking the ball. I don't have a ball with me today, but that's when you take a ball and you just walk it like up your arm or up the child's legs. Walking the ball makes them move their finger separately, isolates them as they move the ball, you know, up and down their leg. 
in playing with Play-Doh. Like I said, they can poke the Play-Doh, they can dig at the Play-Doh and pull it apart and try to find something hidden in it, hidden inside. Um, so again, this just helps with strengthening hands and fingers. And the last activity I like to incorporate is just pulling tape. I use painter's tape. You can put it on the wall, doors, windows, table, um, and then they have to start it and peel that piece of tape off. So when they have to, you know, try and get that paint peeled, it's really making them um, isolate their fingers to get that started. Okay, so for vision and compensatory skills, we can just start by enhancing what we already have in the home. Um, so the first thing we want to do for kiddos that are going to be braille readers and writers is we want to expose them and we want to surround them um, with braille, <clears throat> like Julia, excuse me, like Julia had mentioned earlier. So as providers and teachers, we can provide braille labels for items that they can place all around their home. They can label appliances, they can label toys, they can play label uh, rooms in their home. This was one thing um, that my DTV did um, for my kids when they were little. And, um, you know, we still have doors. My son was obsessed with numbering our doors in the house. So I still have doors that have the little braille number. And so my front door is door number six. And I just can't bring myself to like um, take the braille number off even after like 15 years, it's still on there. But, um, you know, that exposes them to braille and it surrounds them. So like we've mentioned before, their, their peers, their sighted peers, see print all over, whether they understand it or not, they see it. So we have to make sure that our kiddos with um, no functional vision are exposed to braille as well. We can adapt books um, by adding texture. So, you know, when they can't view the illustrations, um, then we can make those pictures meaningful to them. But we also need to remember to use meaningful textures. And, and by that, I mean, don't use the same texture for every object. So an example I would use is, let's say you have an animal book. Well, not every animal should be identified with the same soft texture because then there's no discrimination. There's nothing different between those animals in the book. So I always advise people to, you know, look at what's important on that page. Cause you, you, again, you don't have to add texture to the entire page. Just what was the focus of this page and what is an important feature of what you're focusing on? So an example would be a cat. I don't want to use the same soft texture to identify the cat as I would the dog, right? So what's a different feature of a cat? I go to whiskers. I think of whiskers when I think of a cat. So rather than to use a soft texture to um, add to the cat image, I will actually go to my broom <laughs> and cut little ends of my broom and glue those onto the book page, you know, the page of the book and add that to the cat and that's his whiskers. And that's how I identify the cat. Um, you know, if it's a horse, again, I don't want to use the same soft image. So I think what's an important feature of a horse? It's their mane. So I use some type of material to only put for the mane. Um, so it's very important that we add meaningful textures to the books. And when you add a texture to the pictures, that helps them find the object. And when they're finding the textures or when they're finding the braille, then it's helping them learn to identify and discriminate what those textures are. It's helping them with a tactual search, you know, so it's, it's in, going to encourage them to use, you know, both hands. And it also helps them with learning directions because we might have um, textures on top, on bottom, you know, left and right. So we're going to use those positional words and start um, some concept development. All right. If our children have any functional vision, of course, we want them to find the objects visually. We can have them find requested pictures. Of course, um, you know, we need to make any modifications or adaptations um, that are necessary um, based on, you know, their, their vision and, and what do they need. Um, different ways we can have them search for objects if we need to uh, make it less complex, you know, make it a little more simple for them, we can place the same object on each page. So an example that I use a lot, or I use a lot with my families, um, since a lot of my kiddos like Elmo, because they're red, you know, he's red, I have an image of just Elmo's face. 
And then I go get black cardstock paper and I put it in a three ring binder and excuse me. And on every page, I only put Elmo's face, but on the first page, Elmo might be in the middle. On the next page, Elmo might be at the top. On the third page, he might be at the bottom. So as we go through these pages, um, the child is encouraged to visually search for Elmo. And I actually, just really quickly, I actually had a family that came up with a fantastic idea. She had board books that some of them were kind of ripped and no good anymore. So she actually covered the pages of the board books with black paper and then put the image on that. So, you know, we go back to board books are easier to turn than, you know, paper pages. So she used basically recycled old board books for this. So it was a great, a great trick. I, I love that. Um, so again, when they're visually searching for those objects, we're helping them with learn those directions, top, bottom, left, and right. We're encouraging some visual scanning. We're helping them with object identification. And it's also helping them with pointing. You know, if we say, where's Elmo? Perhaps they can point, or it helps them with following a point, like if we need to point to encourage them to, to visually find what we're asking them to look for. All right, and the last strategy with vision and compensatory is making tactile experience books. Of course, when we make tactile experience books, they need to be unique to your child. They need to be unique to your student and only based on something that they have experienced. And by doing this um, and, and incorporating those real objects from the event that they experienced, that helps them recall the activity. So let's say your child or your student went on a field trip um, and we want to make an experience book so that they can recall that activity and that they can share this activity, social, um, you know, social opportunity. They can share this activity with family members or friends. So some objects that we may include to make the book would be a straw from a milkshake because maybe after the field trip to the zoo, they stopped by the ice cream stand and got a milkshake. So we want to include the straw to um, incorporate that they, you know, stopped and got ice cream. Might include a coin because um, the child used a coin to pay for the merry-go-round that they rode at the zoo. And then we also may want to include some bark or blades of grass from the playground um, that they went and visited for a little bit um, during the field trip. So this is just an example of using real objects from whatever event they experience so that they can recall and share that activity with others. All right, the last domain I'm going to talk about is the combination of self-help and social. Um, we need to remember to always talk to our students and children, first of all. So describe to them what they are feeling, whether it's temperature or texture, um, describe to them what they are smelling and describe to them what they are hearing. Because for children with complete vision loss, this is the only way they will gain an understanding of the world and what is happening around them. And we can make this a part of our daily routine. So this is one thing that always stuck with me um, when RDTV worked with me when Ethan was three. It was one of the first, well, she gave me two. One thing she always told me is treat your child like a child first, treat your child like he's, a, he's visually impaired second. That was the first thing that has always stuck with me. The second thing she always said is talk, 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 because I'm not a big talker naturally. Um, and so she told me, she's like, you have to talk. So when you go to the grocery store, you take him in the freezer aisle, you open up the freezer doors and you talk about how cold it is. Oh, burr, it's cold. And she said, yes, people are going to look at you and think you're funny, but it doesn't matter. This is the only way he can understand what's happening around him. When you're in the kitchen preparing a meal, Take your child in there and verbally describe to them what they are smelling, what they are hearing. If you're cutting things, let them feel, you know, a banana hole, feel a banana cut, feel a banana with a peel on, feel a banana with a peel off. Again, you know, this is all helps with self-help. Um, smell, you know, if you're in a walk downtown and you go by the bakery, let them know what they're smelling. If they walk by a bakery, they identify it's a bakery or um, there's a vacation spot we always go to and we try to walk by Kilwin's ice cream store. My kids know every single time we're at Kilwin's. They know we're coming up and they're like, oh, we're at Kilwin's. So there's no sneaking by. 
Um, let them know what they're hearing. Again, this we have to verbally describe to them what's happening so that they um, know what's going on in the world. Also, they can't read social cues. So we need to help them understand what their feelings are and how others may be feeling. So a few of the books that um, Julie and I like to share with our families that talk about feelings um, is Happy Hippo, Angry Duck, and that was Sandra Boynton. And Today I Feel Silly and Other Moods That Make My Day by Jamie Lee Curtis. Okay, and the last strategy I'm going to share with you before bumping it back to Julia is song boxes. So this idea was actually shared to me by a colleague, um, Rebecca Lambert down in St. Louis. And then kind of around the same time, um, Julia and I received some song boxes from some friends in Connecticut, and these have become one of my most favorite strategies with families. So before I explain it, I could really put the use of song boxes as a strategy in any developmental area that we covered today. It helps with language and cognitive development because of the repetition, um, the rhyming sounds that make up the words in the songs. And it also helps with any expansion of vocabulary. Song boxes help with motor development um, because we are going to provide children with an opportunity to act out the song. So they're going to practice some fine and gross motor skills. So you fine motor skills, maybe they're going to need to do the movements of Itsy Bitsy Spider, or maybe they're going to row a boat, right? So they're going to get some bigger movements. They also promote visual and or tactile discrimination between objects because they are going to search for the object in the box just like they would a story box. Um, but I put it in social and self-help self because it gives them the opportunity to choose which song they want, right? So we're giving them the choice. We're letting them decide what song they want to um, do right now. And it's something we can do together as a, as a teacher as a parent, as a caregiver. So it helps build relationships because it's a positive experience between the child and us. So a song box is very similar to a story box. We um, put an object in the box that associates with the story. So a couple examples here is I may put in a boat, a little plastic toy boat to um, be associated with row, row, row your boat or a spider for Itsy Bitsy Spider, a star for Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, a bus for Wheels on the Bus. Um, I have incorporated little dolls from the Dollar Tree store um, to uh, go along with head, shoulders, knees, and toes. And I should back up to um, another idea that was given to us by our friends in Connecticut is like a wooden spoon for row, row, row your boat, like for the oar. So you could use that as well. So they can go in, um, they pick the object, and then we sing that song, right? And we get them involved in those movements. So again, they're active participants, they're not passive. And this is a great strategy that can be a part of their daily routines. And it definitely can help with transitions because it can mark the beginning of a new activity or it can mark the end of an activity. And that is all of the strategies I have for the develop. Oh, I'm oh, one more page. Sorry, this will be really quick. Okay, the last one is the Moonlight Storybook Projector. And I wanted to include this because this was given, this idea was shared to me from a family. Um, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner, the little projector, if some of you are old enough like me, <laughs> those little projector toys that we used to hold up to um, you know, to our face, and we would press the button down, and it would they would like give us the movie right when we were kids. So this is the um, same same idea. What this does, it clicks on to your phone, and it uses the flashlight on your phone to project the image. Viewmaster, thank you, um, and it uses the a um, the flashlight on your phone to project the image up on the wall. So all you, the app itself is free. It's a Moonlight Storybook projector. The app itself is free. You have to purchase the kit, the little clip for your phone. And then you purchase the books that come in the projector. And honestly, 
the books are no more expensive than if you bought the actual book. Um, but this was an excellent opportunity for family time. The family shared that they all sat in the living room. They projected the story up on the wall. The child with low vision was actually able to view the picture because they were able to control the lighting and the image was big. And the child's older siblings then read the story. So it really incorporated all family members into this activity. So I wanted to share that one. Um, and with that being said, then now I think I am done with my strategies and I'll bump it back to Julia. Okay, so I know we're kind of running shorter on time, but um, I wanted to touch on strategies for working on early literacy with our little ones who have CBI. So when we have a kiddo with CBI, we really need to take a close look at where they are in terms of visual functioning. And I'm just gonna use the CBI phases, um, Christine Roman's phases as a frame of reference. So we all are kind of on the same page, we know what we're talking about. Um, we also have to think about their symbolic understanding and that's more an issue of cognitive versus visual skills. So we need to, to understand, do they know that a 3D object is the same as a 2D image? Um, and then most importantly, we need to focus on our goal. So in birth to three here in Illinois, we have our meetings with the teams. We come up with specific goals for our students that are led, chosen by the families. So we look at that family priority. What is the goal we're working on? But within a lesson, we might even have a goal. So are we trying to teach concepts and vocabulary? Are we trying to create vision opportunities for the child? Or are we working on that understanding of 2D images, that symbolic understanding that's such a critical component of literacy? So let's start with phase one. A child in phase one has not yet achieved appropriate fixation. So you know that the technical term is peeking. No, um, they're just taking little peeks, little glances at objects. So they're not fixating on anything long enough to gain appropriate detail to where they can really understand what is that object? What are the salient features of that object? You know, what makes a ball a ball and a rubber duck a rubber duck? So, and that would also apply to images. And so compensatory skills are so important at this time for learning concepts and vocabulary. So we're definitely going to use objects and textures as Sarah mentioned in previous slides. And I just have to give an example. I don't have a picture of this, but I read an article about a story box where it was based on an experience story where the family went to Dunkin' Donuts and they saved the coffee cup and they saved the donut box. And so we have a scent-based story box. You can still smell that coffee. You can still smell the sugar and the donut box. And I just thought that was a fabul fabulous use of real objects to illustrate a story, so a compensatory-based story. If we are focusing on giving vision opportunities, we need to encourage looking with light, color, or reflective material. On the right, I have two pictures. One is of the story that's called Three Little Pie Tins and a Red Pom Pom. The link to get that story is below and I believe it'll be placed in the chat as well. It's very visually simple. The pages are black. The materials are either reflective or bright red and there are no words. So the goal here is for the child to glance at this book as many times as possible for as long as they can. And then repeated exposure to that book will help build familiarity and hopefully build visual skills. The picture on the bottom is a snapshot of a digital book from Paths to Technology Digital Book Library, which I will have the link to that on a later page. And this, you can present these books on a tablet, a phone, a computer, whatever technology you have. The key here is backlighting. So for children with CVI, backlighting provides that nice, sharp, crisp image. And the light helps when we dim the lights in the room, we're eliminating the visual complexity in the room. So we're giving those maximal visual supports. We wanna make sure it's brought close. We wanna make sure we eliminate visual clutter, again, by dimming the lights, or we can use a black background. We wanna use their strongest visual field. So if we are encouraging looking and literacy time is a great time to do that, we need to make sure that those supports are in place. I'm gonna break up phase two into early phase two and late phase two, because I think there's just too big a difference between the visual functioning of a child who's just entering phase two as compared to one who's getting ready to push into phase three. 
So in early phase two, a child is just beginning to achieve those appropriate fixations. And so we're, we don't know for sure if they're getting enough detail to really understand images, but they might be getting enough to understand objects. Um, visual field is still really important. I have several students who have issues with lower visual field neglect down here below. So we, we will use a slant board. This also helps if the child would have issues with head control. So just keeping that head up instead of letting it drop, you know, if we have a, some kind of system that supports their head using a, a slant board is useful there as well. So if these children are being presented with real objects in their books, look and touch might not be simultaneous. The two pictures I have below, one is a routines-based experience story. So the child went to a birthday party and then some of the objects that were similar to those that were at the birthday party. So the little party horn, the cupcake wrapper, and then there's some other objects in the book um, were, you know, this is just construction paper stapled together. That's basically how I, that's my go-to when I'm making a book for a family. Um, and so these objects are, affixed to the pages where the child can use compensatory skills, explore them tactually, you know, play with them as much as possible. They might not look at them at the same time, but they might do that, you know, looking and then touching and looking and not touching. And, and that's fine. The other picture is um, the tactile connections, 2D symbols. These are made by APH and the link there below tells how these symbols tactile symbols were used to create an experience story about making hot chocolate. So they were set up in sequence and the child could feel each of those tactile symbols that corresponded to a different part of the story. So that's a great way to incorporate that 2D to 3D understanding. We're trying to push them closer to getting ready to see 2D. In late phase two, this is where I will really challenge a child with photos and working towards pictures. So Again, it's, it's dependent on the individual child and it goes back to those cognitive skills as well. Are they ready for this? But I will try to pair objects with photos, familiar objects as much as possible, ones that are you know, in the homes that we can use. Uh, the pictures on the right are taken from an article um, that corresponds to the link below. And that article was about transitioning a child's communication system from 3D objects to 2D photos. And it's, it's really a great article. If you get time, you should check it out because the mom, she uses those real objects and then takes photos of the real objects. And then she expands that into an array where she displays the different photos as a choice board. So adding that, you know, adding that additional complexity as her child could handle it. So we're always thinking about the presentation, like still thinking about our strongest visual field thinking about complexity of array and thinking about the child's positioning and the photo positioning. In phase three, I tend to be really conservative, um, even though in phase three, our children are starting to lead with their vision. So we're really gonna put the focus on vision. I will still keep those other compensatory supports in place as much as I can. I'm still gonna do story boxes with them. I'm still gonna use tactile symbols but we will challenge them as well. So I, I will keep those supports of hearing, touch and smell. Backlighting is still important for some students in phase three also. So using the light box to present objects when we're corresponding to objects in a book or using a tablet. This picture here is a snapshot of one of the CVI friendly videos that you can access those at the link below. And there are a number of these, I think about 40 of them and they're excellent. And I'm so grateful to the TVI, her name is Allison D'Souza who created these. Um, they're very visually simple. They all have a black background and photo quality images. And usually there's just one word per page that corresponds to the object in the photo and it's highlighted in red or yellow. And these are little videos, so they're moving. They're, and some have sound, but for some of my students, we might turn the sound down if I'm using them with students in an earlier phase. But I feel that they're a really great first step into associating words with objects and photos. So speaking of digital books, um, I mentioned that Path to Technology resource library of dig ready-made digital books. So if you just go to the link at the bottom of my page here, um, 
you can access, I, there are just dozens, dozens and dozens of these books, but there is a section that is um, appropriate. It says CBI friendly, that you can go and find books that would be appropriate for children with CBI. Now these are for all ages. So for me, I, I look for the most basic books and they have a couple, um, one of them was that vegetable book that I had a snapshot of earlier. Um, those are a great way to get started. And that's a way that I introduce digital books to my families. But what's really meaningful and powerful is when we can use photos of the child's own objects and especially those favorite objects in digital books. Um, and it can be more motivating. You can do this in many different ways. You can simply use the photo album on a tablet or a phone. You can use PowerPoint or Keynote depending on your technology or you can use iBooks. One great thing about uh, digital books is that you can simplify images. And I found one more way that I wanted to share with you today, um, the Tiny Tap app. So this was an article on Paths to Technology. I have the link at the bottom of my page if you wanna check that article out. Um, Tiny Tap has a free version. So this is the version I recommend to families, but as of a month ago, when I made this presentation, the teacher version was free during the pandemic and it's usually about $70. So it's worth checking out if you can still grab the teacher version. Um, you can create books on your own with, like I said, those familiar objects, that child's own objects and really customize, or you can start by borrowing books from their library. You just have to search. There's a search button and you just search for CVI. In fact, there's a seven minute video on this in this article that shows you everything about how you need to get started using TinyTap. So it'll walk you right through it. What I like about TinyTap are the settings. You can choose your background color. You can choose your highlight colors. If you want to pull images from the internet, you can choose images that have no background already. So then you don't have to edit your images. It's so nice to skip that step. Um, you can highlight an area on the screen for the child to tap. So you can use these just as books, you know, just reading them, or they can be games, so little activities where the child is presented with two images and they're supposed to choose a specific color or a shape or something. And when they touch that highlighted area, they get fireworks and a little sound. So it's really nice. Um, it's just really motivating. I'd encourage you to check that out if you are interested in that for your families or your students. So we just have some resources listed here. As I mentioned, getting Braille books into the homes of our families is always a, a super high priority for us. So here's the Seedlings Braille book link, um, the Dolly Parton slash APH program here, and National Braille Press is another source of Braille books. We had to, of course, include Paths to Literacy because this might be our most visited website where we get literacy ideas for our little ones. They have an excellent um, section on emergent literacy and they always have new blogs and activities as well. So finally, we just wanted to close by sharing our contact information as well as our calendar of events for ISVI. Um, we have been hosting monthly webinars with guest speakers. And in May, our speaker is Dr. Therese Paletko. That will be May 18th at 10 a.m. Central. <laughs> so that's 11 Eastern. Um, but we have recorded webinars as well, if you're interested in checking out any of our past speakers. And with that, I'll go ahead and open it up for questions. See if I can see the chat. I've been trying to answer them as we go, Julia, so far. Yeah, so. did you find the, oh, did you find the one about um, books about children who are visually impaired? No. There's a good was... article on Wonder Baby. Um, I can't get to my email right now. I'm going to text it to you, Sarah, and maybe you can share it. Sure. Yeah, I can find it. Wonder Baby is a great resource also, we didn't mention that, but it has a list of books at this link that either the characters are visually impaired or it just talks about visual impairment. Um, there are a couple about canes. I like Arthur's glasses myself. I don't know if you're the PBS character, Arthur, he, he gets made fun of for wearing glasses. Um, and then there's one about a little girl who has a patch. I can't remember her name. Those are some of the ones I like. 
the patch by Justina Chen Hadley. That's one I like about amblyopia. Oh, thanks, Catherine. <laughs> okay. And we can send a um, Acrobat version, PDF version of this presentation. If you guys are interested, we can send that to Catherine and she can get that to anyone who would like to have it. I'm putting the article in right now. So just bear Catherine, with has, me. Catherine has it up. Oh, she did? Yeah. Okay, good. She's fast. Okay, yeah, very fast. Did I miss any more from earlier? No, I think someone said, love to use the app novel effect with my students. As you read the book, the app provides sounds which correspond with the story. We've seen that. We saw yeah. that at um, Bridges a couple years mm -hmm. ago. It was great. Mm -hmm. I think Catherine, when we send you the handout, do you, will you just disperse it to all the participants? Yes, you'll send the handout. We will ship it off with the survey link. Great. Okay. Perfect. So everyone will get it. Mm -hmm. I, I can answer this one. Um, the person who would love to watch this again. Well, we recorded this and uh, this will go up on our YouTube channel. Actually, all of our um, all of our webinars are recorded and available on our YouTube channel. Um, it will take a couple of weeks for for it to be available because they'll make sure that it's uh, professionally captioned and and all of that. So there's a tiny bit of delay, but uh, you should be able to find it at this link that I'm about to put in. Fast with your link, not with my own. <laughs> All right. So yeah, you can just go to uh, www.aphconnectcenter.org backslash webinars, and you can find it there. So if you are interested in other similar types of events, I, I know we're wrapping up. We were just talking about it before uh, before you all joined us. We were talking about how we um, don't know about you, but we're thinking uh, that uh, teachers are, are getting a little ready for summer. Um, but other events for the Connect Center are available um, at the uh, aphconnectcenter.org website. You can check out other offerings if you're just itching to keep coming to zoom meetings over summer um yes they are they are totally awesome presenters i agree um i should also tell you that if per chance you have a family who has general questions or is looking for resources um they they can get information or they can access the um connect center information and referral line. Uh, so they can email their questions or you can email for them. Um, the email address is connectcenter at aph.org uh, or there's a toll-free number 800-232-5400. Uh, That's uh, staffed by a human from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Eastern time. But um, that is open to all sorts of, of questions about resources or um, uh, things that are of use or need um, for by or for people uh, with visual impairments. Um, so are there more questions for Sarah and Julia before we let them we let them escape for the day. 
because if not, I can go ahead. Um, uh, we have 15 more minutes, um, but it sounds like folks are wrapping up. You guys, are, uh, Julia, Sarah, do you feel like we're wrapping up? Oh, the, the archive. We've got, we got it. Can CVI kids outgrow the need for the bubble letters in phase three? Okay, so I don't feel qualified to answer this question because I only work with birth to three. I think that that would happen at a later stage in their literacy experience. But um, yeah, that, that's just something that I've, I've only taken them about that far <laughs> in birth to three, where we're just introducing the fact that there are words and that maybe they go with the sounds that we're making. They go with those words that we're saying. It's a great question. I bet that that paths to literacy link might have some answers. What do you think? Yeah, and I'm thinking about the um, the new LMA companion guide by Matt Tejan and Christine Roman, uh, the sensory balance one. That's where I would go look. I need to get in that book. I've seen a presentation on it, but they do talk about the different supports that children use as far as literacy media through the phases. And that's where I'm going to go look when I look up that question later, because now I'm really curious to know. Um, that's where I would, I would start and just check out that if you, you can Google and probably find their presentation. They did some a presentation that's on Perkins on past to literacy. Um, but then there's the book as well. Sensory balance. Awesome. More questions. Just being patient. Giving people a chance to. Oh, wow. Did you see that, Catherine? Can she email you with the compiled document oh. for free Braille books? Yes, ma'am. And wow. uh, would you like that shared? Because we're happy to share that with the group. Put it I think so. I think that's what she wants it to yeah. be shared. We can do that. that. That's a very generous offer. Thank you so much. Yep. Yeah, that'd we be great. Arrangements. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put my email in the chat. <laughs> I almost gave you my personal well, email. I mean, Sarah's right. We learn everything from the, our families. We learn, we get all our best ideas, our best resources, and definitely the most up-to-date information from our mm -hmm. families because they're the ones that are digging in deep mm -hmm. you know, to what's available out there. Thank you so much. That's I agree. Great. I got my yeah. best ideas from my families. And then I just use them with other kids. Yep. <laughs> pass it on, pass it on, pass it on. No. All right. So if we are, if we agree that we are ready to move on, um, I can go ahead and uh, post the closing code. Um, I'm just pulling it up, I'm pulling it up here in the wiki world. It's hidden in wiki. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to put it in the uh, the chat box, and then I can stop us and say that, actually I'll pause it.